I hope you're good. Um, I'm really glad to be here at PowerJS. I was actually in the past one, which was six months ago. I suggested Dave, since it's one of the few conferences that are done like twice a year, to use Sember, so that they can use like minor version for every conference per year, and every time they change year, major version or something like that, because it's confusing to have like two conferences of the same the same year. But I don't know. Anyway. So I'm here to talk to you about basically reactive front-end, and that means that I'll be talking about observables, streams, and reactive programming. So hands up, who has used observables before? OK, it's not that many. That's good, because that means that you'll learn more, probably. So my name, as I was saying, is Martin Gontovnikas, but since we are in the tech world, my Twitter handle is mgonto. If you want to follow me and increase my ego, I would greatly appreciate it. So let me first introduce myself. I'm a software developer from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So this is my accent. I hope you can understand it. And I work at Odd Zero. Odd Zero is basically a SaaS that helps you with authentication and authorization. The idea is that you pick an SDK for like AngularJS, Node.js, iPhone, Android, whatever, and then with a couple lines of code, you get authentication working with username and password, or social things like Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, or enterprise providers like Active Directory, LDAP, SAML. Unfortunately, I've run out of t-shirts, so I won't be able to make you be my walking promotion today. But next time, probably, I'll have some. So I used to be there coding JavaScript all day long. So this was me, basically. And now I'm actually a developer advocate. Um, and a lot of people ask me, what does it mean to be a developer advocate? And basically, it's the same that I was doing when I was 17. This is me singing in a karaoke. But instead of singing in a karaoke, I'm now speaking about technology in different events. In order to speak, you still have to learn. And for learning, again, programming. So this talk is actually about reactive front-end. So let's actually start with that. But before starting, I want to give you a warning. Let me actually increase the size. This is the great thing about doing presentations with HTML. You just zoom in and everything works. So we are going to learn a little bit about functional programming. We're going to learn a little bit about reactive programming. What we are not learning anything about functional reactive programming. If I say functional reactive programming too many times, a Haskell programmer would come and shoot at me, basically. So we're not learning about that. Just in case if somebody here is a Haskell programmer, we're not doing that. So, one question that a lot of people, of people ask is like, why should we go functional? So I have a very nice, familiar, imperative code, like the one that we see here. This function is just basically checks for odd numbers. So it creates a results array, and then it iterates over all the, 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 the parameter that it got. It does it for each to that. And then for every number, it checks if it's odd. And if it's odd, it adds it to the results object with some exclamation marks and then returns the result. Something that we can see here is that we are creating this result object, this result array in the beginning. And then every time we iterate and we find an odd number, we are mutating this result and then eventually returning. So this actually works perfectly. This is nice. So why should we actually go functional? Why should we learn functional programming? And the thing is that JavaScript as you know it, is going to change very soon. And why is that? Because cores aren't getting much faster. So a few years ago, you were actually coding an application for the browser in JavaScript, and it was like really slow, really, really, really slow. So what did you do to make it faster? You waited three months to release it. And that works, because people's CPU, people's processors would get faster, so in three months, I'm the best programmer in the world, because now it's like really performant, it's working very well. But unfortunately, we don't have that advantage anymore, because now cores aren't getting much faster. So what is, is happening now? Instead of having one core, we're having two, four, eight, 16, 20. And what that means is that if we want to make our applications faster in the browser, we can't just wait. Now we need to be able to write code that will run in these separate, these separate cores. And what that means is that real concurrency is coming to JavaScript. So this is the face. The first time I said this, these are the faces of the people like, really? Is real concurrency coming to JavaScript? What does it mean? Will I have to change all my code? And the nice thing is that it's not yet there. 
But that's the main reason why you should learn functional programming. Because functional programming actually has goals that aligns with parallelism. So that means that if I'm writing code that will run in separate concurrent cores, functional programming is good for that. And that is because it embraces immutable state, which means that state cannot change. And it also embraces no side effects. In order to explain no side effects really, really easy, it means that if I'm calling a function with x, it will always return y. So that means that whatever the, the function does doesn't depend on external state and doesn't modify external state. If I find a function that returns nothing, it has side, side effect because it's probably doing some change to some state. So why is this good for concurrency? Because so who here has worked with threads either in like Java, .NET, or something like that? Hands up. I'm sorry for you. So if you have done that, you have used probably logs or mutex or stuff like that. Because let's imagine you have a thread that writes, one thread that reads. And they are both operating on some state. And if the, the one that writes does it before the one that it reads, everything works. But if the one that reads is reading something before it's written, well, it won't work. And in order to make that work, I needed to add logs, mutex, uh, like writes. And it was like really hard. But the thing is that if we now have some state that doesn't change, if we have immutable state, that means that one thread doesn't have to wait for another, and we won't have race conditions anymore. And if a function doesn't change state, and all it does is given an X request always return Y, it's much easier to debug, it's much easier than to maintain. So that's, that's the main reason why you should learn functional programming. So what does it mean to do functional? Basically, we can already do it with JavaScript. We can call this map, filter, and reduce methods, and it works. So this is the same function that I showed before. And what it's doing is, again, it's receiving an array of numbers as a parameter. It's then, it's then calling this filter method with a function. And what this does is, when I call this filter, I'm sending a predicate that will check for every number to see if it's odd or not. So it will iterate over all the numbers of the collection see if they are odd or not, and if they are odd, they will be added to a new array. That new array is returned from this filter. And then to that new array, I'm calling this map function, which basically iterates again over all of the elements of the array, and it just returns that element plus some exclamation marks. It again returns a new array, and then that's returned. So the main difference is that we don't have this results object that we used to have, so we're not mutating state. We're basically creating arrays on every step. So this is immutable. We're not creating new objects. So this will be much easier to parallelize. This will be much easier to work once we actually have concurrency in JavaScript. So that's it. That's the end of the talk, right? And the thing is that it's not. Because I have a friend who was actually working at Netflix. And he actually encountered a problem with this approach. So let me first tell you about the application. They were doing an application that's called Argus. And it's basically a real-time dashboard for Netflix. What they were doing is they have like all of the people that were watching Netflix, they had stats for them, like how many movies were they seeing, how many TV shows were they seeing, how much time were they paying attention or not. So it had like dozens of graphics. It had web sockets so that it could get real-time information for people watching Netflix at that time, and also lots of rich users' interaction, which means clicking on a button or things like that. So this is the app. So as you can see, you can, it has like a crosshair. You can zoom in. You can change like one day, two days. And you can see in real time all of the information that is gotten with lots of graphics and lots of interactions. So they built it. They used functional programming because then they, they, they wanted to parallelize this in the future. And they worked towards the first big demo. And they were feeling like really confident because they created reusable components for these graphics. They were also getting all of the information in real time from the WebSockets. They were using a very big test data. And they got all of the mouse interactions working. So they were really, really happy. They were like, this is going to work. So on the demo day, they decided to connect this to the production database. And well, this happened. <laughs> yeah, that's the team like, escaping after it broke. So this is what happened. And why did this happen? Because they were using too much functional programming. 
they were using a lot of array map filter and reduce. And what's the problem? Because let's, if we go again to the function I showed you before, I was calling first a filter and then a map. How did it work? The filter iterated over all the elements of the array that it got. It checked for the odds and returned a new array. Then we called the map. The map iterated again over all the elements of the array, added exclamation marks, and returned a new array. So that means that every operation that I do in here is first iterating over all the elements of the collection again. So if I have filter map, filter map, I will iterate over all the elements of the collection four times. And also, each of those return a new array. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm returning a function with only the last array. So all the inter intermediary arrays that are created for the filter map, filter map, which are four new arrays, I don't care about them. But they are created, and they need to be garbage collected. And garbage collection takes a lot of time if you have too many arrays. And also, iterating over elements also take a lot of time. So that means that nothing worked, because they had too much information, too much intermediary arrays, too much garbage collection. And this is when reactive programming actually comes, because what they realized is that, well, we need stream processing. What we need is reactive extensions observables. So what is an observable? How do we use it? It's basically the same. Instead of saying array filter map, we do observable filter map. So it's pretty much the same, like if you see the syntax. But what it's doing behind is very different. Because when I'm doing the filter and map to the array, it's iterating, returning new array. When I do it on an observable, it's specifying some transformation that I want to happen. So that means that when I do this observable filter map, nothing happens. All that I'm doing here is defining a transformation chain that will occur once I need to get the information. And once I need to get the information, what it will do is it will iterate over all the elements from this basic observable. And for each of them, first, it will run this filter operation. It will say, is this odd? And if it's, if it's odd, it will then, con if it, sorry, if it's not odd, it will say, OK, I don't care. If it is odd, then it will run it through the map operation and add these exclamation marks. So no intermediary array is created, and I'm iterating over the main collection, this observable, only once. And that's like pretty nice. But the question is, what else can observables do? And it comes to the definition of an observable. An observable is basically a representation of any collection of values throughout any time. So what does it mean? An array? is a collection of values at an instant time. Because right now, I'm creating this array with four values, and that array is basically a collection of values. But that means that this, this is not only an array. It could be, for example, mouse events. So mouse events are basically click, click, click. is an event object. So we could create an observable, which is a collection of event objects throughout time. Because I click it now, I click it in 10 seconds again, I click it in 20 seconds then. So I can have a, an observable throughout those 30 seconds that will have these three click events. And it's a collection of values over some time. So that is pretty cool. And, and the thing is that observables can be merged, concatenated, and zipped like any other collection. So if you have used lodash or underscore, all of the methods that exist there, like not only like this zip, merge, and concatenate, but intersect, union, all of them that exist there also work on observables. You can also run all of those operations in an observable and also create your own. And the thing is that observables are basically a pattern to do three things. First, to start a data stream, a data stream so to set it up, then to emit 0 to n messages, and those messages are run through this transformation chain, and once that transformation chain ends, I'm tearing down this observable, and I can do some operation when I'm tearing it down. So this is all that an observable is. We will see in a, in, in, in a, minute, in a few minutes like two examples of how we can do that, so that it's not like this theoretical. But something that is important is then, what is a data stream? And a data stream can be an array of data. It can be mouse and keyboard interaction, DOM events, network I.O., animation, speech recognition, choice thing, input, or anything. Anything that is a collection of values through time can be an observable. That's basically it. These are just examples of things that you can do with that. So meanwhile, going back to Netflix, uh, observables actually solve another problem for them. 
and it's that sockets die. So this, they had this, this application, this dashboard, with web sockets connected to every customer they had. So imagine that I'm looking at the dashboard, and I'm like, yeah, this is cool, but I gotta move to the other building. So I close the laptop lid. The minute that I close the laptop lid, that socket is killed. And then when I go back, I open it back, that socket has to be relieved. However, it's not that easy, because when, when you were seeing that dashboard, you were actually connected to 10 of different web sockets. Each of those web sockets must receive a subscription message, and then you got like different messages from them, which you didn't know which ones you got until now. And when it's closed and reopened, that means that I have to keep state of which sockets I, I had called before, at what state they were, where they, they, did they have the subscription, did they not, and that's like really complicated. But this could be an example of how we can actually use observables to solve it. So what they created is first a socket observable. And what you see here is the same pattern as, as before. So in the setup of this observable, basically the web socket is open. Then it emits the zero to n messages. So it gets all the messages from the web socket. And once all the, web, or, or all the messages are sent, or if there's an error in the web socket and the connection is closed, I get either an error and it closes the soccer the socket, or I get all the messages, and again, it closes the socket. So this is a basic observable that wraps the, the web socket. And then they had a multiplex data observable built on top of that. And what that did is, on the setup, after the web socket was open, it sent the subscription message. Then they filtered out all of the results that they cared. And then, once it, when it was about to tear down the socket, it would send the unsubscription message. And the most interesting part of this is that observables can retry. So in this pseudo code, what you can see is that I'm first sending the subscription message, then I'm filtering over, I'm, I'm getting all the results from the observable, I'm filtering over them, and then eventually I'm sending this unsubscription. And the nice thing about this is that if the laptop is, lid is closed, that socket will error out. And when that socket errors out, I can use this retry operation. And what the retry will let, let me do is retry the whole observable again. What does it mean to retry the whole observable again? It means to open again the WebSocket connection, send a subscription message, and start getting the information again. So I don't have to code all of that redo and things like that. I can just use this retry operator, which will take care of actually retrying until it works, because the, this observable is erroring out because the WebSocket was actually disconnected. This is a pretty complicated example, but we'll see a, a more simple example in a second. So before continuing, one fair warning. You should never trust a developer that has nothing bad to say. So in this case, what is bad is that RxJS, so using observables, has a pretty decent learning curve. So in order to use observables, you have to change the way you think about the problem. Because it's different how you set that problem up versus how you do it normally. And then there are a lot of operators that you need to learn. Not only this map, reduce, filter, but you have this retry, map latest, select latest, there are a lot of them. And you'll have to learn a few of them so that you can actually use them. Uh, what happens to me a lot is that I don't know that an operator exists, so I build it myself, and then I'm like, oh, this existed, so why did I lose my time? But well, that's like part of learning this, basically. And the other thing for observables is that sometimes they work async, and sometimes they work sync. So for debugging, that can bring a few problems. So before going to the two examples, I want to show one more thing, which is when we were coding before, let's imagine that we had a value C, and C depended on A and B. So I have A plus B, and then eventually I'm doing something with C. If A and B change, I have to be aware of that change so that I can change again C. So that means that C is like completely coupled to A and B. Because every time that A or B change, I need to know of that change so that I can change back C. The nice thing with observables is that I can actually have an, an observable of A, an observable of B, and I can combine them and create a new observable of C. And now I can work with this observable of C. And whenever something changes or, on A or B, that will automatically change this observable C. And what that means is that it's not coupled, that now I only have to care about this C observable. I don't care with it, where it comes from, because I know that I will always get the right information. But the question is, like, how can we use this today? What can we do to use it today, right now? And 
For that, we're basically going to use RxJS, which is reactive extension for JavaScript. This library was created by Microsoft. One of the main guys who did it was Eric Meyer, who is like a genius in functional programming and observables in general. So it's a pretty good library. And for these examples, I will be using the Angular toolkit. So this means that all of the examples are Angular code. However, all of, all of what I show works for Angular, works for React, works for jQuery, they work for everything. And reactive extensions have toolkit for all of those frameworks because the core is always the same. They just have like a little layer on top that will make it to be easy to code in that library or, or framework. So let's actually start simple. Let's imagine a counter app. A counter app is like the hello world for observables. So in here I have a button, and every time I click on the button, the counter increases. However, what you can see is that the counter is not increasing always the same amount. Every time I click it, it increases a different amount. And that's because what I'm doing is I'm going to the server, I'm asking the server what number should I increase the counter. When I get back the result, then I first log that somewhere, and then I just increase this counter. So basically, I, it's increasing a different number because I'm getting that value from the server. So how do we implement this? First, we have a button, and this ng click is like an on click. It's basically a click handler. And what I'm saying is whenever this is click, call this function, this increase counter function. And then I'm just showing the counter value, which will keep on changing whenever I click. So if you write like regular Angular JS code or regular front end code, you will have this increase counter function, this increase counter method, which will be the event handler. And in there, what I'm doing is I'm first asking my API server, get the counter amount. So I'm saying, API server, how much should I count? Once I get the value of how much I should count, I then log it to some other server, because for me it's important to log it. And once I get that back, I just update this counter object with whatever it had before, plus what the server just returned. And that's what, every time that I click it, that's what it's increasing the number. So this is how I would do it, regularly writing like normal JavaScript code. In this case, with promises, it could be with callbacks or with anything else. So how do we turn this to an observable? And this is basically the code. The first thing that we're doing, just because it is Angular, is adding the module dependency for Rx. If we were using jQuery or React, we would just either include the script tag in the index.html, or we would use like CommonJS or import system from ECMAScript 6, and we would import this Rx dependency. Once we have that Rx dependency, we're calling this create observable function. So what this is doing is, every time that this increase counter is clicked, it, it will add a new value to my stream, to my infinite list. So this create observable function will return me an infinite list of clicks. At first it will be empty, but then every time that somebody clicks in there, I will have a new value. So imagine that it's empty, somebody clicks, I get a value right now. Five seconds later, somebody clicks, I get a second value to this infinite click. 10 seconds later, somebody clicks, then I have a third value in this list. So all this is doing is creating this infinite list of clicks. And after this, what I'm adding is the transformation chain that I said before. So the first transformation that I'm doing is I'm converting the clicks to the counter amount I need to sum on each step. So I had click, click, click. Now I will get three, four, five. And that's because for each click, I'm actually converting that to a number that I got from the server. Once I got that, I needed to log it to the server. And that log server function is a function that has a side effect. Why is that? Because it returns nothing. So that means that it's doing something that has a side effect. Something that is cool about observables is that we can use this do function, which lets me isolate side effects so that they don't bother the rest of my code. So in here, I'm just logging that number. And after that, I'm using this scan function, and I'm, it's basically a sum. It's summing every new value that I get to the one that I previously had. So again, I had click, click, click. That got transformed to three, four, five. And now it gets transformed, the first value is three, because it was zero plus three equals three. The second value will now be seven, because I had the three, I got the four, three plus four equals seven. And the last number will actually be a 12, 
because I had a 7, I received a 5, now I got 12. I did practice the math. I'm not that good at math. I always come like this. But what does it mean? That means that I had click, click, click. That got converted to 3, 4, 5, and that now got converted to 3, 7, 12. And at this point, this is the point at which I want to show the values in the UI. This is the point of this transformation chain that I care about. And that's when I use this subscribe. This subscribe is what changes this stream into an observable. And that's because it, 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 it's still an infinite list, but now I'm observing the value because now I care what value it has. So this subscribe is the one that is actually running all of the transformation that I put before. If I only put before the flat map, they do an scan, and I didn't add any subscribe, this would do nothing. And that's because, as I said before, an observable is lazy. An observable is just a definition of transformation that I want to apply at a certain time. And this subscribe is what is triggering these transformations, because I'm saying I care about the values, and since I care about the values, those values need to be calculated. And that means that these transformations have to be run. So in here I'm saying, I care about this 3, 7, 12, so let's subscribe to that. And every time you get a new number in this infinite list, notify me so I get this counter, and then I'm just setting that to the dollar scope dot counter so that it gets shown in the UI. I let that sync for a minute. Second parameter that we have here in the subscribe is a function that will let me handle errors. The nice thing about this is that this error function will let me handle errors that can happen either in the flat map, in the do, in the scan. Throughout the transformation chain, whatever error is there, I can actually handle, handle it in here in this subscribe. And that's it. That's all I need. I'm, in this case, I'm showing everything because I converted click, click, click to 3, 4, 5, and then to 3, 7, 12. Then I'm saying, OK, I want to show that. So I, I showed the 3, then the 7, then the 12. And that got showed every time that somebody clicked. And the, nice, the, the last thing is that an observable will always keep on running, and that will occupy memory. So what I'm doing here is that when somebody goes out of this website, of this page in particular, I need to dispose this observable so that the memory is not used anymore, because this infinite list is infinite. So it will always be waiting for new values. If, if I'm leaving this page, that means that no new value will come. So I need to tell it, dispose yourself so that you can be garbage collected, basically. So this was my expression the first time I saw this. It was like, it seems cool, but I'm not 100% sure that I'm getting what happens. So I don't know if it's because like, I'm a child inside and I'm like two years old, but I understand things with graphics. So this is what has been happening. I'm doing promotion to Buffer, apparently. This is what happened. We got first a click, in this case a circle, and that went through a box that is a transformation chain. So that click got converted to a three. That three is now this diamond. Diamond was a really hard word to learn in English, really hard. So, because in Spanish it's rombo, it's like completely different. Anyway, we got the click converted to the three. The three is this diamond. And then we're converting this diamond to a sum. That sum is a square. So now I have this sum. Again, we had the click, went to a transformation chain, three, went to a transformation chain, three again. However, at some point in time, maybe in 10 seconds, maybe in 20, I got another click. And then that new click that I just received got again through all the transformation chain. So that click got converted now into a five, no, sorry, to a four, and that four got now converted into a seven. And then I got another click. And that keeps on happening. So if I could be like, I don't know, Superman or whatever, and I could be seeing this infinite list throughout time, so if I didn't know exactly that time, this would be what it looks like. Imagine that this line is like infinite. It means like 10 hours. So throughout 10 hours, I got 10 clicks, which got immediately converted to 10 numbers, which then got immediately converted to 10 sums. And at that point, I care, and I'm showing it. So this is it. This is the most important thing to understand. And when I understood it, I was like, yay, I got it. But once I got it, it was like, click on a counter are very few events. So why do I use observables for that? And I was like, yeah, it's good, but 
it's like really not that useful. So let's actually do uh, an, an example with more events. So now we have this forward.js is awesome. And whenever I move the mouse, the forward.js is awesome text will follow me. So if I move it fast, it will follow me fast. And this is the example that we are going to build now. Something important, for example, from when we see the code, if I move the mouse, you can see that the letters move one at a time. They don't move immediately after the mouse. They move one at a time, actually at the 100 milliseconds difference between each other. So how do we implement the forward.js is awesome? Because this is obviously something that you would do in production in every website, right? <laughs> so how do we do it? So in this case, I'm creating a web component with a directive on Angular. It's not important. It's basically saying it will occupy the whole screen, and the text will be forward.js is awesome. And then I'm creating this web component in Angular with a directive. It's not important how I define it. But the important thing is this. I'm having first a div, which is the one that occupies the whole screen. And I'm adding an event for mouse move. So whenever the mouse is moved throughout the window anywhere, I want to be called to this function that is called mouse move. Then I'm having a div, which is called text container. And that div text container will have all this phrase, forward JS is awesome. And then inside there, I will have, sorry, I will have one span per each letter of the phrase. So one for the F, one for the O, one for the W, and so on. And each of those letters, each of those spans, will be absolutely positioned. I'm, I'm, I'm setting that position absolutely so that I can move them around the window. So this is the template that we have right now. Now let's see how we code it with this template. So again, first thing we do is we call this $create_observable function, mouse moved. So what am I creating now? I'm creating an infinite list of mouse move events. So whenever the mouse is moved, I'm getting a new event, a new item on this infinite list. And the first thing that I'm doing is I'm converting this mouse move event into an offset. So this is the text container. This is the text. This is the mouse. I move the mouse. In this precise moment, there's a difference between the position of the text and the position of the mouse. So what I'm doing is I'm converting the mouse move event to a, to a, to a list of offsets between the phrase and the mouse pointer. Once I have this list of offsets, I actually have to convert that to an offset per letter, because I will need to move each letter separately. So I had one offset per, per word, per phrase, every time that the mouse is moved. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually returning a new, R, a new observable inside. So what I'm doing is I had mouse move, mouse move, mouse move. I converted that to offset, offset, offset. And now each of these offset, offset, offset will be converted not to one value, but to multiple values. It will be converted to one letter, so to one value, sorry, per letter that is on the phrase. So that means that I had again, mouse move, mouse move, mouse move. That got converted to offset, offset, offset. Now we'll have F with offset, O with offset, W with offset, blah. F with offset, O with offset, W with offset, all the rest. F with offset, O with offset, W with offset, and all the rest. So now I'm having, in this observable, one value per letter, an offset that I need to move. And now it's actually time to do the animation, because I need to move now each of these letters at a different point in time. So now, again, I had the text here, mouse pointer here. I moved the mouse pointer. I got the offset per letter, but now I need to start moving the letter. So move the F, move the O move the w. And that means that I need to move these values one at a time throughout time. Because as I said before, I don't want to move them all at the same time. Each letter moved differently. And this is another place where I can actually use observables, because an array is a collection of values at an instant time. But an observable is a collection of values throughout time. So what I can do is this timer that you see here, this timer operator, let me add, let me actually convert one value that I had before into a value that will be added to this infinite list at a certain point in time. So I had the F with the offset, the O with the offset, and the W with the offset. And now what I'm saying is, 
Now, with this information, send the F with the offset right now. Send the O with the offset that you need to move in 100 milliseconds. Send the W with the offset that you need to move in 200 milliseconds, and so on. So in here, I'm doing a transformation that is not only transforming a value to another, it's transforming the time at which this element will be added to the observable. And now, what I got from here is the F with the offset that I need to move at the zero millisecond. The O with the offset that it needs to move in 100 milliseconds later. The W with the offset that it needs to move in 200 milliseconds. And at this point, again, I care about what's going on. So again, in this case, I subscribe, and now I will be getting the letter that I need to move, which and which offset, and that's where I move the letter. And I also will get these values at the 100 milliseconds difference. So I don't even know it here, but I will get called to this function with a 100 milliseconds difference, and that is what will be making this animation work. That is what will be, what will be making that whenever I move the mouse, each of the letters move one at a time. And then again, I have to dispose it. So after this, I was like, yay. Now I can finally understand observables. I can finally understand like, the potential that they have. But if you just saw all that I showed you, it's not that easy to understand at first. And that's what I meant when I said that you need to change how you think about problems. Because we just handled tons of different mouse move events. We built an animation. And that's something that is not really easy to make without observables. With observables, it was easier. It was just four transformations and maybe six lines of code per transformation. But in order to be able to build that, you have to change the way you think about the problem so that it makes sense in your head to actually do that. So something important is that this is actually just the beginning. Shafar Hussein, who is actually my friend that works at Netflix, he's in the TC39, and he's actually proposing observables to be added to the browser. Like, promises exist now. Probably soon, we will also have observables in the browser. So that means that it's a pretty good moment to start learning about observables, because they will actually be part of the browser itself. It won't be a library. They will be part of the browser. That's a proposal that he's sending to the TC39. And also, another thing is that if you're using any other library, any other language that is not JavaScript, you can still use it. There is RxJava, Rx.net. So there's a reactive extension, which is the library that lets me do observables for each of the languages that are out there. So even if you don't do JavaScript, you can do the same thing, because the concepts are all the same. Once you understand what an observable is, you just have to learn the syntax. But other than that, it's the same in whichever language, whichever framework, whichever anything. So my proposal is basically to start reacting to everything. It's not React from Facebook, it's reactive. One more thing before ending. Let me actually zoom it. So in this link, if you go there, you will be able to get the slides that I've just shown you. Also, all of the examples that I've just showed you right now, they were actually coded. They are not like the document that doesn't compile. They were actually coded. So you will be able to get those examples from there. And another thing that you will see there are some additional links regarding reactive programming. Basically, it's a Coursera course about reactive programming by Odersky and Eric Meyer, which is absolutely great. And an Egghead course about RxJS and how to use it. It's actually pretty good. So that's it.